Well, welcome back to the show. Today, we're talking about the ethics of whether or not employers should be able to pressure employees into being vaccinated for COVID-19 and whether or not this may be a charter right violation. My guests, two incredible individuals, Carol Crossan of Crossan Constitutional Law and John Carpe of the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. One of the things that we love most here at Fateen TV is hearing from you, our amazing viewers and supporters. We often receive encouraging calls and emails commending us for diving into some of the most challenging conversations in our nation right now and hitting topics head on. Well, it was right around the end of the summer in the middle of the federal campaign that we started getting a different kind of message. And it was from people who were rattled, who were reaching out to us for information and even for help because they or one of their loved ones was being threatened by their employers with job loss if they did not receive a COVID-19 vaccination by a certain time. People are rattled in trying to understand their rights in the situation given the fact that their livelihoods and the provision for their families in many cases is on the line. The calls we got were from healthcare workers, from teachers, and also those working in the private sector. Now, to be clear, in many of these circumstances, people had deeply thought the situation through and had very personal, often medical, reasons for their choices. Well, one or two calls has now turned into what we have observed to be a flood of professionals in different sectors pushing back on these medical mandates and even going public. In September 2021, a group of 3,500 medical professionals in Alberta published an open letter expressing their concerns with a mandatory vaccine mandate that had just been ordered by Alberta Health Services, also known as AHS. In addition to this, a flood of individual cases of people willing to challenge the mandatory orders in the courts are also being taken on by groups such as the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms and the Canadian Constitution Federation, as well as several individual constitutional lawyers. So this is a huge topic hitting many Canadian homes and businesses hard. So here with me today to discuss things from a constitutional law perspective is Carol Crossan of Crossan Constitutional Law and also John Carpe from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this extremely important conversation for both our health and our freedoms. And I do want to say right off the top, if you have a personal story on this issue that you want to share with us, please don't hesitate to email us at info at faithteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844. And we are always here for you to give you any information that we might have on the topic that would be helpful. So with that being said, Without any further delay, let's get to it. Well, it is such an honor to have Carol Crossan, a constitutional lawyer right here in Canada, representing some clients in Alberta. Thank you so much for your time today, Carol. Glad to be here. Thanks. Now, for our viewers, just really quickly, uh, just give a quick uh, intro to uh, what you do and the organizations that you currently represent and give stewardship over. I run a law firm in Alberta, and I'm a constitutional and human rights lawyer. I practice in that area. I've worked in the area for about 10 years. I work right across the country. I've been in about 11 jurisdictions, I guess, and levels of court right now, and clients all across the country because these issues happen all across the country. I also uh, run a charity called Rights and Freedoms Advocate, a charity dedicated to helping people stand up for their constitutional and human rights, Fatine. Incredible. So this definitely isn't your first rodeo. That goes without saying. Well, let's dive right into the issue at hand. And so you helped craft this letter uh, to AHS, the Alberta Health Services 
corporate office is who it's addressed to. It ended up being an open letter representing over 3,500 health professionals in Alberta. Um, talk to us about the content of this letter, and then I want to dive into why, uh, why you feel that there might be a constitutional charter challenge here. Sure. Well, I didn't craft the letter. The health professionals did themselves. Uh, there's over, as, as you said, 3,500, I think, last count. 35, 44 health professionals all across Alberta who have signed this letter. And the letter really uh, focuses on choice, in my view. That's what these healthcare workers put out a statement on, that they're a pro-choice group in that they believe everyone should have the right to choose whether or not to take the vaccine. They've made it clear in the letter that they represent both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. These aren't all people who are unvaccinated, but they do believe, I guess because the medical profession, Fatine, one of its foundational principles is informed consent. And so, so that's the basis for their position. Absolutely. Now, I want to start, this is the second last paragraph on the letter. And by the way, if you just Google this, you can find this letter on the internet right now. But it states here, we believe that the proposed vaccine mandate is contrary to Section 2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as Section 7. Can you unpack that for our viewers? Every day, Fatine, I'm getting about, I would say, 100 communications from people who are concerned about the vaccine mandates from both unvaccinated and vaccinated folks. And this is what their concerns, as well as this letter, rest on. They believe in autonomy and conscientious rights, and they stand on that against this vaccination mandate. And they also stand on Section 7 of the Charter, which is a section that firmly applies because it says that every individual in Canada has a right to life, liberty and security and the courts most recently have examined that issue in relation to personal autonomy in medical and healthcare choices and that's in the recent Carter decision on assisted suicide. So those two uh, fundamental principles, fundamental rights, this issue touches at the heart of both of them. Okay, and in the letter, you unpack, or the, the individuals who crafted this unpacked the reasoning behind it, um, one being uh, that historically scientific consensus has been that natural immunity is superior to the vaccine. So uh, many healthcare workers are already recovered from COVID-19 and might have natural immunity. So why isn't that considered? That's uh, outlined here in the letter. Um, also, the um, evidence now stating that the vaccine does not prohibit um, or prevent transmission. And then the reports coming out of the UK and Israel regarding the high percentages of people in the hospital who have been fully vaccinated. So would you say that these are the primary concerns of those that you're representing in this letter or are there some others? No, they're concerns they, they ably put within the letter. They're right within the system. They're seeing this play out before their eyes. And you will notice in the letter as well, they draw attention to how taxed our system is right now. And so they take great risk, these medical professionals, Fatim, in sharing their story in attaching their name to this letter. But they all care deeply about informed consent. They care deeply about the taxing on the system. And so for them to speak up, they believe in this. Uh, they believe in this from a foundational level. It's very brave of them to speak out on this issue. And really, I think it goes without saying that we're, we're kind of being hedged in on both sides here when it comes to the taxing of the healthcare system. One, they're trying to stop the flood of COVID patients in ICUs. But the other hand here, we could be looking at a mass exodus of some of these medical professionals um, because of this mandate. Are you hearing that from anyone that they're saying this is a line in the sand that if this isn't revoked, then I might wash my hands and not be a part of the medical profession anymore? Is that a vulnerability here. I'm hearing it every day and I'm seeing that in this letter. It is a grave concern. You know, what I worry about, Fatine, is that in our society we have such polarized views that it seems difficult for us to just talk about openly the statistics that we're seeing from other countries very clearly. And these folks are bringing forth those reports, those studies, 
but there is such a polarization of views that it's difficult to just discuss that. What's the best way for our system to continue to flourish? And until we can have that open discussion without people on either side feeling that they'll be stigmatized, it's difficult to engage in that debate and find the best solutions. Absolutely. And we appreciate your courage even to come on this show today and crack open the conversation a little more deeply for people from a constitutional perspective. Let me ask you this, Carol, what has the response, this was an open letter, what has the response been from both the public and also from AHS if you've had any response yet? We haven't had a response from Alberta Health Services yet. I am hearing, of course, every day from people who have deep concerns about this. I not only work to help and support and represent healthcare workers here, but I'm hearing from people in Ontario. I'm trying to help them, BC. And then I'm also hearing from all sorts of other people in society that are distressed. They're not distressed about a medical choice, Fatine. They're distressed about their own opportunity to have the right to decide. That's what they're distressed about. I'm hearing from vaccinated people who are very distressed about that too. They took the vaccine, they feel comfortable with their choice, but they don't want that choice to be foisted on others. Today, if our freedom is robbed on taking a medical treatment and on this one, what happens tomorrow to our democratic society, Fatim? That's what I'm hearing from everyone. So they bring to me their practical concerns and their practical concerns are, I will say tragic, but their bigger concern is what's happening in our society that we would agree with this. It, it, that's the big concern I'm hearing. They crafted a press release for this issue and in it they say, we are not an anti-vaccine group. We are against medical coercion. We respect an individual's right to choose or refuse treatment and to exercise informed consent and the right to bodily autonomy. They also note in the press release, there are more healthcare professionals supportive of our position and letter, but they're fearful of signing this letter. Fatine, that should never be. That we can't engage in civil, I mean, much of my work is free speech work, that we can't engage in civil debate on this issue it doesn't matter what we're debating. We need to sit down at the table and be able to talk this through. But there is there's difficulty right now in just getting to the table and talking about this without people feeling that they'll be stigmatized over it. Right, absolutely. Now, I want to dive into the big pushback on the position that you're presenting today, and that's that the Charter, um, you know, Section 7 talks about the right to life. And so some people who are strongly in favor of the mandated vaccines would say, listen, you getting vaccinated protects the life of those around you, the most vulnerable. And, you know, there are different studies now that are coming out province by province that seem to be indicating that the vaccinated are recovering better. They might not be protected from getting COVID-19, but they seem to be recovering a little bit better than those that are not vaccinated, at least where we're at right now with the current variant. So what would you say to that argument that you getting vaccinated protects the life and liberty of other Canadians? And is this one of those situations where in the court of law, it would be a matter of a judge deciding whose rights or whose life is more valuable, the person that might have an adverse reaction to a vaccine or the person that might contract COVID-19? Well, I think the heart of the debate starts with the question about how efficient or uh, how much efficacy there is to the vaccines. That's what I'm hearing from clients. And so, of course, I'm not a medical professional. I can't speak to that issue. But I know the letter does draw attention to that, and the healthcare professionals are drawing attention to studies. If a case on this is fought, some of those questions will come out before the court. And the court will have to determine how reliable is the information that Alberta is depending on in order to form its narrative, because there's a lot of people who are questioning that right now. 
Okay. Well, and from what I'm hearing from you, you are standing in defense of people's rights to be fully informed before they uh, enter into a medical procedure, particularly one that is irreversible like a vaccine, and the right for them to express their viewpoint. And I want to encourage everybody that's watching this to take a minute or two and read that letter, read the open letter where some of these arguments are laid out uh, very eloquently and uh, easy to understand. We definitely appreciate this conversation here today. And of course, the, the ultimate end of the line here is should somebody be losing their job over this, their livelihood, and uh, putting their family at jeopardy because of a desire to maintain their own medical autonomy. These are huge, huge social questions, freedom questions. Uh, final question here, Carol, any last words to Canadians that are watching this right now regarding where we're at as a society on this particular issue? Yeah, uh, two points, Katie. One, if you feel you want a choice over what you do with your body, you're not alone. I want people to know that. There's tens and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people right now that are questioning that. If you feel you're alone, you're not alone. If you feel that freedom is something that's being jeopardized in our society, you're not alone. There are lots of people that are going through this on the practical level, I don't know if that helps, but on, on the psychological level, I think it helps to know that there's a lot of people, vaccinated and unvaccinated, that have concerns about freedom. But second, if you value democracy, let people talk about this. Engage in civil debate. We don't have to be so polarized that we can't speak about this issue and, and to stigmatize one side of the population. That's never helpful, never helpful. Uh, a thriving democracy thrives on civil debate. And I hope we can at least restore that, Fatine. Whatever the choices are, I have friends who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. That's not the issue to me. The issue is freedom and choice. Well, those are powerful and poignant words. Thank you for that exhortation. We're going to be watching for that response from AHS. And thank you so much for joining me today to bring light on this issue. Thanks for having me. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor-funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax-deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit Fateen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. Well, it's always a privilege to have John Carpe from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. No stranger to our audience. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be with you, Fateen. Okay, well, let's dive right into the topic at hand. We're talking about employees that are being pressured by employers, whether public or private, to get a vaccination in order to keep their job. Now, you guys just published an article here regarding what's happening with the Alberta College of Physicians and Surgeons. Can you explain what's going on there for our viewers? So the College of Physicians and Surgeons has issued a warning that any doctor that does not get vaccinated is going to get disciplined and could lose his or her license to practice. Uh, this is extreme pressure tactics. It's extreme bullying. It does not want any debate on uh, remedies that uh, are effective against COVID. Um, uh, but the college says uh, no discussion allowed on that. No discussion allowed about uh, vaccine harms, about uh, informed consent. They're shutting down all debate by essentially threatening to expel every doctor, every nurse, every other health practitioner, shut them out of the medical sector entirely unless they get on board you know, and, and that might be just well and fine if there were no doctors that were raising concerns, right? And so the issue here is really that there are doctors that are raising concerns both about the pressure and the science. So did you have a specific group of doctors that asked you to take this on or did you just sniff it out and say, we're going after this one? 
Well, we are in touch with a lot of doctors, uh, not only in Alberta, but we're in touch with doctors in, in every province. And um, we will be taking Alberta Health Services to court. Uh, we currently are signing retainer agreements and um, f on behalf of doctors and nurses that do not want to be bullied by Alberta Health Services and are going to stand up to, to this kind of pressure. Um, and that's similar. It's not the same as the college, but they are. They, there's a similarity there. Alberta Health Services is the government, uh, government-run medical system in Alberta that is issuing the same demand. Uh, came out a few weeks earlier. Uh, it, in a way, it's even more severe. The college is, is saying to doctors, "We're going to take away your license to practice medicine entirely." Uh, both of them are closely related and it's the same, uh, you know, it, it is so anti-science because we've always had debates about what is the best kind of treatment. Treatments change from decade to decade. You know, what, what we're using today to treat cancer is not the same as 50 years ago. Uh, there are things that 30 years ago we thought were very wise that today we see as being not the best practice. So in medicine, there's always a, a history, a tradition of debate about what is the best therapy, what is the best treatment, what is the best drug, uh, what is the best non-drug treatment. This is part of the scientific process where you have some humility and, and doctors and other scientists will debate about what is best. And this, and now we got the caller shutting down all debate on on COVID and lockdowns and vaccines, and essentially, uh, we're being told that the only solution to the problem is for everybody to get vaccinated. Well, <laughs> a lot of doctors disagree with that. Absolutely, and you know, in this show today so far, we've been really focusing on healthcare workers, medical practitioners. But are you hearing from people in other sectors as well? Like, what about teachers? What about the private sector? Are, are a lot of people reaching out to you guys saying, "Hey, how do we deal with this uh, pressure that we're experiencing?" It is. Uh, we we are we have been inundated with with hundreds and hundreds of uh, requests. In fact, the, the Justice Center, it's, it's, we're probably into the thousands now of people contacting us. Uh, our staff lawyers are going to focus on challenging government because that's really our mandate is to hold governments accountable. And it, it bothers me to no end that we don't have enough lawyers on staff to also help people that are struggling with their uh, private employers. But basically, this is, uh, it's bullying, it's an employer, it's illegal. Uh, when you have a job at a certain place, uh, neither the employer nor the employee can suddenly unilaterally change the terms of the contract. That is illegal in employment law. And so what these uh, bullying employers are doing is illegal because they are suddenly demanding a uh, violation of medical privacy uh, by by asking personal questions about whether you've had a vaccine or not, which is none of their business, and creating this brand new condition that people are supposed to get injected, and suddenly you've got employers putting on pressure and saying you're going to lose your job if you don't take the vaccine. Well, that's it's illegal. It's contrary to employment law, uh, and it's hard for employees to push back, of course, because uh, ideally you need to hire a lawyer to uh, to represent you. Okay, so you're getting thousands of contacts like that. I, I can't even imagine just the administration in that. You probably have an auto responder on by, at, by this point in the game, but thousands. And so I, I've got to ask this, what are you telling people to do? So you're saying, okay, we don't have the capacity to take on every single case. You are a charitable law firm that does a lot of your work pro bono. Um, where did these people go that you're just not able to service? Um, do you direct them towards like a notice of liability letter for them to give to their employers or something else? We, we ourselves are not uh, making the notice of liability letters available, but I've seen other groups and organizations and lawyers use them. And I think that they are an excellent tool for accountability because it's entirely fair if an employer is pushing you to get a vaccine, 
Well, I think employers deserve to have an opportunity to put their money where their mouth is and say, sure, I'll, I'll sign off on a, on a liability that I will pay for any uh, damage or harm that you suffer as a result of the vaccine. Yes, I'll put my money where my mouth is. Now, employers may or may not sign that letter, but I think it's an important tool for accountability. Uh, we have a letter for that employers, uh, sorry, that employees can use when they're being threatened by their employer. So that's on our website, uh, Justice Center Constitutional Freedoms, jccf.ca. Uh, if you go to the COVID section uh, and look at frequently asked questions, and there's a letter there that employees can use to write to their employer. And there's also a letter there that students can use to write to their own university or college. And the purpose of these letters is to slow things down and get the employers and the universities to stop and think about what they're doing. And, uh, you know, here and there, uh, when you make the effort, you, you, get, you often get success. If you don't make the effort, you, you're guaranteed to have zero success. But if you make an effort, uh, sometimes you have success. Now, we've talked a lot about sort of the student, the employee position in this. But what about business owners that are feeling pressured by the provincial policies that are being implemented to have to be the police officers for vaccine passports, for mandated vaccine measures? Um, are you hearing anything from business owners right now about all of this? You know, business owners, this is the same government bullying. Uh, the government is getting other people to do its dirty work for it by threatening businesses with fines if businesses do not check for the, uh, the vaccine passport. Uh, and most importantly, vaccinated people are spreading the Delta variant just as much as unvaccinated people. So there's absolutely no reason to discriminate against the unvaccinated because it should just be a personal choice. So what do you say to the person who's watching this right now and says, you know, listen, John, you are being irresponsible. You are spreading misinformation that could possibly harm the general public. And they just outright reject uh, all of your premises that you, you've kind of outlined here today in this interview. What, how do you respond back to that narrative and that voice right now? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. And I know a lot of people feel uh, they have strong emotions in favor of vaccination. Uh, Israel is one of the most vaccinated countries in the world, and their hospitals are full of COVID cases, even with 80% of uh, over uh, adults, 80% of adults or 80% of over age 12, I forget which. But this is a massively vaccinated country. And they're now talking about you're going to need a third shot to keep your vaccine passport current. And they're talking about a fourth shot. The Netherlands is talking about uh, they've already allocated money in their budget for third shot, fourth shot uh, next year. Iceland is heavily vaccinated and people are getting sick with COVID. Uh, there are American college campuses with 98% vaccination rates and people are getting sick with COVID. So the vaccines are not stopping the spread. And uh, that, that's just a fact. That uh, And this has been admitted publicly as well by senior officials of the Food and Drug Administration and the Center for Disease Control, the CDC. Uh, senior officials there have said the vaccine does not stop the spread. So the only benefit it provides is personal protection to the individual recipient. So there's no justification for uh, having any discrimination against the unvaccinated minority. Yeah, so I guess the only response to that might be the, the case for limited ICU beds. So somebody might be looking at this saying, you know, you, you're fine to take that risk for yourself, but what about limited resources for healthcare, which is a whole other conversation that we'll probably have to pick up with on another show for sure. But John, um, as we conclude here, any final thoughts or remarks for our viewers on this very controversial conversation today? Well, just briefly on the ICU beds, the politicians have had 18 months, <clears throat> they've had a year and a half to expand ICU capacity, and that could have been done for a fraction of the cost of what the uh, lockdowns have inflicted on our economy. 
I think the most important thing is get information from two or three or four different sources and uh, don't believe uh, everything from one source. That would be my, my word of encouragement. Okay, well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> we will call this a wrap. John, I am always so grateful for your insight and uh, for your strength and fortitude in continuing to defend the constitutional rights and freedoms of Canadians. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me on your show, Fatim. Well, once again, I want to say thank you so much for joining us for this very challenging and you know hard-hitting conversation for a lot of Canadians out there right now. So if you want to watch this show again, share it with your friends, good news, just go to fateen.tv and there you'll have easy access to our free iPhone app. We're also on many platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole bunch more. You can watch this show again and other previous episodes at just the click of a button anytime that you want to. Finally, last but definitely not least is we want to give our weekly huge shout out to our monthly partners, regular donors. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Your faithfulness helps us stay faithful and stay at it, stay on air every single week talking about these important conversations for our nation. If you want to join the team, increase your partnership, give a special donation today, any of the above, simply go to fateen.tv or give us a call at one 866 844-0844 and our team would be honored to talk with you and to serve you in any way that you need it. Thanks again for joining me this week. Hope to see you next week.